So getting started in our journey about sky slope and DigiSign, uh, it's important to first identify what the heck these things are. And I'm sure, I'm sure you probably have some ideas since you're clearly here to learn a little bit more about these two products, but I do find it's very important to start at the beginning to make sure we're all on the same page. So sky slope or sky slope forms, as you'll see it often referred to as, at its core, it's a document management system, very similar to web forms, which I know a lot of you would be familiar with. It's the home for all of your real estate forms, whether they're forms from our brokerage, forms from the board, forms from ARIA, or anywhere else, to be honest. Uh, you can use Skyslope forms to collate and fill out your paperwork online. You can put together offers. You can complete your listing paperwork. You can fill out FinTrack documents. Really, the sky's the limit. If there's a form, it can be filled out in Skyslope. Even if you're doing paperwork with like a pen and paper too, you can scan these documents and you can upload them into Skyslope. So Skyslope or Skyslope Forms is the form management system. It integrates tightly with the other thing we're gonna be talking about today, DigiSign. DigiSign is the digital signing platform, okay? This software is similar to AuthentiSign or DocuSign, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, maybe you've used in the past. You fill out your forms with Skyslope Forms and then you use DigiSign to prepare your documents for sending to your clients for signature. Okay, they're so tightly integrated. When you're using Skyslope Forms, you don't honestly, like you don't even notice that you're in DigiSign as well, but they are that tightly integrated. Skyslope and DigiSign are products that we provide to all of our agents at Central Trail and Heritage Group. Okay, our staff and management are all trained to support you in using these products as well. And they're really on the cutting edge in the marketplace for what they do. I really, really want to stress here how important it is to learn these platforms. Like even if you're in like that comfy, cozy space, you've used web forms and AuthentiSign for years, it's really well worth learning these platforms. Skyslope and DigiSign, in my opinion, are actually superior products, but more importantly, we provide these to you directly, okay? And as we've seen in the past, Treb, Korea, different boards and associations that provide realtor services, they can pull technology on very short notice. And since this is something that we provide you directly as a brokerage, you can have confidence in that these platforms will be supported by us for the long term. Take the time to learn these products. Trust me, it's well worth the investment. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna tackle is logging into Skyslope for the first time. And the easiest way to do this really depends on the board that you're a member of. And I'll explain why shortly. So I'm gonna start with, if you're a member of the Toronto Real Estate Board, you log in to TREB, there's a Skyslope Forms button right here, okay? You can click on that. And what that'll do is it'll take you directly into Skyslope Forms. The other way you can do it is if you're actually in a listing in TREB, this is in Realm, but it works for Stratus or, or Matrix as well. You'll end up having a little hot link at the top of the listing somewhere. Again, it depends on which system you're using, but it'll say Skyslope Forms. You click on that button and it'll log you in directly without needing a username or password to log in Skyslope Forms. The third way to log into Skyslope Forms, or maybe second way, <clears throat> the generic way to log into Skyslope, and this is if you're not a member of Treb, or even if you are, you can log in this way too, is just to go to skyslope.com, S-K-Y-S-L-O-P-E.com, and there's a login button in the top right. What I do is I'd click on Skyslope Forms, and it'll bring you to a login screen. You put in your email, this is the email that you're registered with, with the board, if you have problems with any of this process, it might just be, you know what, maybe we've got the wrong email on file for you on our Skyslope. Just, you can talk to a manager or the front desk staff. We should be able to help you out there. Uh, but you just put in your email address. I'll put in mine here. And your password, nothing too fancy here. And it'll log you right in. 
okay? With, what happens though if you don't know your password, maybe this is the first time you've logged in, you can click on forgot password and go through the process again here to, if you put your, your email in, you hit submit, it will send you an email with instructions on how to reset your password, okay? So if you have problems logging in, that's the best way to go about it. So once you log in for the first time and you're successfully in the Skyslope forms, uh, the first time you log in, there will be a couple questions it'll ask you. I'll just kind of go over that with you now and there's a little bit of the setup process because it's important to kind of go through that. So the first thing it asks you is what regions do you serve? You just choose the default Canada, Ontario. For some reason it's not there, just or it's not there by default. Make sure you just select those fields going forward. So the next thing it'll ask you is what associations you're a member of. If you're a member of TREB, the only association you have to add is this one right here, the TREB slash ORIA association. It should be added by default, but if it isn't, you click on the add button and then it'll just ask you for your TREB ID and it may take you through an authentication process to add it. If you're not a member of TREB, if you're an ITSO member, so Hamilton, uh, Kingston, other ITSO member boards, you'll wanna make sure that you add the Ontario Real Estate Association as your available association. I wanna reiterate, if you're a member of TREB, you don't need to add this association up here. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay, I'll just show you what the process looks like here. Hit the add button and there you go. So once you've added the associations that you wanna add, you click on the next button. If you haven't authorized either, and if you've come in through TREB, the TREB ones will be automatically authorized. But if you add the ORIA library, it'll ask you to authorize it and you take you through realtor link authentication. And again, you're probably all familiar with this, but what you do is you select the board that you have uh, authentication with, the Kingston, Hamilton, Toronto, whatever it happens to be. You click on sign in the board association and it'll take you, again, this is my Kingston credentials, so it's going through the ITSO interface. So I'll just put in my ITSO board number there and my password. And there you go, it'll authenticate you for that library, for the ARIA Forms library. Okay, so congratulations, you're now in Skyslope. You've gotten through the login process. Uh, there's a couple things I wanna show you before you actually jump in to make sure your account set up properly. The first is going back to those associations. If for whatever reason you didn't get a chance to add them properly before, like I said, don't worry, you can add them now. You click on your name on the top right of the screen and there's an associations button. It'll take you right to the thing saying add an association. So you can add whatever association you forgot to add. If you search TREB, TREB will be there. You just click the add button. Or if you're looking for the non-TREB forms association, you're looking for the ARIA association, you can just look, type in ARIA, it pops up as well, and you click add. As soon as you do either of those and you add these associations, again, it'll probably take you through a quick authentication process, either through RealtorLink or a TREB interface. Okay. The other thing I wanna make sure that you have a chance to do is to go into your user settings. Again, you click on your username in the top right or your, your avatar in the top right, click on the user profile button there, and it'll bring you into this personal information screen. And this is very simple stuff. It asks for your, it'll probably have your, your first and last name, but what else you wanna do? You wanna put in your phone number, you wanna put in the brokerage information as well. So Century 21 Heritage Group Limited, the brokerage phone number, the brokerage, oh, probably not the brokerage fax, no one uses those anymore, but the brokerage address is the other important thing. So put in the street address, city, province, postal code, uh, just to make sure that that's all in there. So when you are putting in forms or you're populating forms in the future, it'll automatically put those things in there. If you don't do this now, whenever you know the brokerage name pops up on a form, the brokerage address, your phone number, you'll have to put these in manually. So it's best to do it now just to save you time in the future. So put all that information in and hit the save button. Don't worry about the brokerage license number, brokerage MLS code, your agent license number, agent MLS code. Those aren't actually linked anywhere. So don't stress over the, putting those in here. So the last thing I want to go over before you actually jump into using Skyslope and learning about using Skyslope itself is Skyslope's amazing support features. You'll notice there's a little help button at the top here. If you click on that, you can go to the support page for Skyslope. 
Sky Soap has a wealth of documentation, tutorials. They also have live chat, phone support, email support. And I've been dealing with it a lot over the past month, and it really is second to none. If you have any sort of question, you can type in here. Let's say you're having problems logging into Skyslope, okay? It'll pop up with a whole bunch of articles on how to log into Skyslope, reset your password, whatever it happens to be. You can click on any of those articles, and you'll have these nice tutorials going through. Sometimes they're video tutorials. Sometimes they're just kind of screen capture ones going through whatever the problem is. And if for whatever reason you can't find the answer to that problem, you can use the live chat. You can call their phone number, which is right at the bottom here. Or you can send them an email too. And I believe it's just support at skyslope.com. And when I say they've got amazing customer support, I'm not kidding. Their response time is phenomenal. And I've seen this firsthand, guys. It's really great. 20-minute email response time. 10 second chat response time. And if you call them, they're going to pick up on the second ring. They're all extremely friendly, well-trained, very knowledgeable, very quick to answer any questions. So if there's any sort of like quick question or anything you need, you can just give them a call, send them an email to use the live chat. So it's extremely useful, helpful, and it's definitely a resource I suggest you take advantage of. Okay. And with that, we're ready to start getting to the nitty gritty of learning how to use Skyslope forms. Okay, so now that we've done with the setup, let's go and start putting a transaction together. So when we're in Skyslope Forms, and this is the home screen, the first thing you'll notice is you've got a list of all of your, they're called files or transactions, listings, whatever you wanna call them. It gives you a list of the addresses, whether you're representing the buyer or the seller, the file owner, which in this case was gonna be you because I'm in an admin account, it shows everybody's here. And then how many forms are currently active in that file and how many envelopes or things you, how many packages you've sent off for signature regarding that file. So I'm gonna start by creating a new file. Just you click the button right here and it goes through this kind of wizard, which is amazing and really simple to use. You just answer all the questions. You may not see this first one, who are you creating this file for? Again, because I'm in the admin, I can create ones on behalf of other agents. It says, who is the client? Representation, are you a buyer, seller, landlord, uh, tenant? In this case, we're gonna be putting an offer together. So let's click on buyer. Uh, okay, the primary client, let's put in someone fun, Tom Cruise. And I'll put in my email just because I don't want to send any spam to poor Tom's junk mail folder. Okay, is there a property yet? Now, if you want, you get to this point, if you have a property that you're putting an offer in on, you can actually import the MLS data. The way that you do that is this. You take the MLS number for the listing you're looking at, you start typing it in. I just took one of the listings that we have for our brokerage. Type in, it should automatically populate. If it doesn't come in here, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to pull in something from MLS. It just makes life a little bit easier if you happen to have it to be able to pull in. So click on the import button. You'll notice it pulls in the street address, the city, unit number, all the import information. But you know, worst case scenario, you can type it in yourself and then it does come up with an auto populating field here so you can figure out where the match is and it will populate it likewise there. So it's not the end of the world if you can't import the data, but it does make things handy. Then afterwards, I'll ask you, how would you like to name the file? Generally, the suggested way to do it is by the address, but it may be something like you've just got in uh, your buyer rep agreement and you don't have an address to attach this to yet. So you can just name it by the primary client uh, or you can just type in something and just put in whatever you want. I'm going to put a test in here just so that we realize this is actually a test if it comes through and filters through. The next question it asks you is, would you like to start with one of your templates? And this is very similar to web forms, how we have brokerage templates for you to choose from. And you'll look through here and it'll give you all the ones that are associated with buyers because we chose buyer up here as who's the client. If I chose seller, it would give me a different set for seller templates. So it does smart filter it a little bit. The one thing I want everyone to make sure they realize is that we've got Treb templates. If you keep scrolling down, we have ITSO templates. So just make sure you choose from the correct set because you either have access to the Treb forms or the ITSO forms, depending on what broker, uh, which association you're you're with or which board you're with. So in this case, I'm actually gonna add an ITSO 
uh, template because I'm a member of the ITSO boards, but you can add a TREB template as well. Just make sure, and it's very important, like I said, to make sure you do the appropriate template. You'll notice that we do have residential freeholds for TREB and we also have residential freeholds for ITSO. So just make sure you choose the one which is correctly matching your association. If you're a member of TREB, use the TREB ones. If you're not a member of TREB, use the ITSO ones. Simple as that. Once you scroll down, you click on the create button after choosing your template. You don't have to choose a template or maybe you created one by accident, you forgot to choose one. That's okay, we can add these later. I will show you that in a minute. So once I hit, click on the create button, the magic happens and a file gets created. Okay, so now we are in one of our files. So you'll notice what you see here is you've got the name of the file, 195 Winford Drive, number 403, test like I named it before. We've got three tabs here, forms, envelopes, and file details. Uh, I'll get into what those are shortly. And then we have a large set of all the forms that we pulled in from our template here. If you need to add any forms, if you notice any are missing, there's a little nifty add forms button here. You just click on that. You can choose whatever forms that you want to add in from whatever library it is. So let's say you wanted to add a schedule. So I'll just put in schedule and here's some schedule A's. I can just add another schedule A in here. Uh, I can click on it to get a preview of it. Looks good to me. I'll click on add. Okay, as soon as you click on add, you can add as many as you want. I'll just pick another form here. Maybe I'll see if I can find a disclosure form. Okay, acquisition of property. Oh, that's already added. Let's put disposition of property. Not that I need it, but I'll put it in there anyways. And then you just click on the next button. And now you'll notice that those two forms that I just added are now at the bottom of this list. Here's the extra schedule A, and here's that extra disclosure, extra disclosure form that I just added. So if you decide, hey, you know what? I didn't actually need this disclosure form. I can just click on these three dots and you click the delete button. You can remove whatever it is that you want to take off this list and delete it. Again, at Heritage Group, we provide you in these templates with all the suggested forms that cover most cases, but there are some times where you're gonna need extra forms in there. And maybe you even got your own document that you need to attach. Maybe it's something already with a signature on it that you did with pen and paper. You click on upload documents if that's the case, and you can pull something in from your computer. You just drag the file over or click on the upload documents button. and It'll ask you which file on your computer do you wanna add. You do that, it'll add to the bottom of the list, just like those two forms I added a moment ago. If you forgot to add a template or apply a template, if you come in and hey, there's no forms here, Where, what's going on? You can just click on apply template and it'll give you all of the brokerage templates that we saw before. You can choose whichever one it is. You click apply and it'll pull in all the recommended forms with the added clauses for the forms that the clauses would be in to this template, this, this file here, all right? Again, we'll get into what envelopes are in a bit. Next thing I'm gonna go over to is the file details along the top here. And the reason that's important is this is just kind of like the basic details about the file. And if you fill this stuff out, it'll actually save you a lot of time down the road. So let's say we wanted to purchase property for 900,000. You put in the sale price, you can put in what our expected closing date is. This stuff will just pre-populate into, any, uh, into our agreement of purchase and sale and other places where the closing date or the sale price may have to pop in. You can change the property address, make any adjustments if you want. You can also change the contacts. Let's say, let's say that I want another buyer in here. I could add another buyer. So I don't know if they're still together, but I'm gonna put in Penelope Cruz as well. And they share my email. So I'll put my email address in here again as well. Okay. And there you go. Now I've got another buyer in here, Penelope Cruz. So now if we go back to the forms, let's start filling out some forms. So we've got all these forms. They're filled out uh, with pre-populated information based on the information we've given so far, like the address, say the offer price, we just put that in. It'll also um, put in any clauses that we as a brokerage have suggested putting in. Again, a lot of you are familiar with this setup for web forms. So let's click on one here. Here's just an example of agreement purchase and sale. Again, I put in two buyers, put in the seller, the property address. And if I scroll down to the section where the clauses are, you'll notice they're all pre-populated with all the recommended clauses that you, if you've done an offer before, have come to know and love. Okay, 
So just going back to our list of forms here, I just want to show everybody something. You can actually choose, a, let's say we want to start sending stuff to our client for signature. Uh, if we want to do a buyer rep agreement, working with a realtor and the APS. Let's say we're starting with those three. You can select them all this way. You can click on fill and send, and that will start the process of getting you to fill out these forms. You get to the screen, you might say, oh, whoops, I forgot to add in a fin track form. So you can just click on add forms. You can add more forms to this, what we're, called, what we're creating now is called an envelope. You can create, you can put these forms in from this file. So that's the ones that are already here. So let's see, uh, we had, uh, I believe, oh, here it is, individual identification information record. I'll add that. I'll click on add document. You notice it'll pop up here. Here's my fin track form. You can also add forms, just generic forms that aren't part of the template yet. So if you click on that, it'll give you the opportunity to go through all of Aurea's or Treb's forms and, and add something to here that would be from that. Or you can upload your own personal file as well. Again, if you have something that's already been pre-signed as an example. So once you have the forms that you decide you want to fill out and work on, you've got a few different options here on the left. This is kind of your management and your navigation section. You can rearrange these. Maybe you want the agreement of purchase and sale right up the top as an example. You can reorder them by holding on to these little sandwich icons, clicking and dragging them around. You can also jump between forms by clicking on them too. See how it jumps from form to form? The other thing too, though, is this is a continuous link scrolling list. So if I scroll up from working with a realtor, you'll notice I get into the purchase agreement. So you can kind of just scroll through at your leisure and go from top to bottom. You don't have to use the left to jump from form to form, which is nice. So you can just kind of go through everything to make sure you've done everything from top to bottom. Okay, I'm just gonna fill in a few fields. I'm not gonna fill out everything because this isn't a seminar about showing you how to fill out an agreement of purchase and sale. But some of these uh, fields will actually pre-populate, like I said before, but other ones you'll have to put in yourself. A lot of them will have date pickers. This picks the date, uh, today's date by default. You can just hit okay, puts in this grievance purchase and sale date of this date. You can fill any other information running on, let's put north side of whatever. Just type in for a lot of these fields, just straight up typing fields. You'll notice that the purchase price is $900,000. We filled that in before we even went into the forms and it just was smart enough to do that. But if we want to make an adjustment, let's say we want to drop the offer price down a bit, put 890,000, it also changes this here. You can put a deposit in, let's say we put in a deposit of $20,000, whoops, not 200,000, $20,000. It will pre-populate with the text version of that as well. Um, just scrolling down here, I'm going to show you how to add clauses as well. Everything else is pretty self-explanatory. Once you click on it, you just type in what you need to type in. But when it comes to the clauses, it's a little bit different. So down here, we've already got all the pre-done clauses that, you, again, you know and love from our brokerage. But if you want to edit any of these, just click on it. And it shows you all of the clauses in this one window. Okay, so you can go through, you can change whatever you need to. Let's say we want to change the time here. So I'll put in 6 p.m. on June 5th, 2023 as an example, right? You can uh, make all those changes here. You click save and you'll notice that, oh, there it updated right there, 6 p.m. June 5th, right? And if you want to add any clauses, you can do that as well. You just click on the clause section, you click on add clauses, and it'll come up with all the clauses we've got from our brokerage, the brokerage specific clauses that we've written for you, as well as your Aurea or TREB clauses um, here as well. So you can just click on the source if you want to filter by source. You can filter by category too. So maybe it's something regarding cannabis, right? If you want an acknowledgement that it's not a grow up, you can search by, like, by the different categories as well. But assuming we want all categories, let's say we want something that is just maybe a septic clause, right? Look, there's one here, it says this is our brokerage clause. I always use brokerage clauses over a real clauses. If we have them, you can take a look, you can take a quick peek to see what it says by clicking on the little eye icon. Looks good to me. I wanna add this clause. You can add multiple clauses if you want to. If you want to do more than one, you can click on more than one. But I just wanna add this one extra one. I'll click add clause and it puts it into the bottom of this here. Uh, here's all the sewage system clause here, the septic clause I mentioned before. And one thing that's neat here is not only can you edit everything, but also it, it it's noting that this is gonna take more than one page up. So as soon as I hit save, it will update and make sure that it flows on to the following page. So you'll notice that we've got the first page here, keep scrolling down, it's got the second page of clauses and notes here that it's it's continuing from the previous page, et cetera, et cetera. We even needed a third 
and maybe a fourth. There's a lot of clauses in here, but it will add pages as necessary based on how many clauses you have, which is pretty amazing. Okay, so once you go through and you've at, you're comfortable with everything you've done here, you can do a few other things. You can save this package of forms as a template. If you're planning on reusing this package of forms, you can do that, save it as a personal template. That's similar to brokerage templates, but maybe you want to do your own kind of set of forms as a, as a standalone template, you can do that there. Um, you also, if you ever need to save your work and just kind of come back to it later, you can click on save and exit. I'm gonna show you what that does right now. First, it'll say, okay, please name your envelope as soon as you click on save and exit. So it defaults to the name of the file. Now, what an envelope is, just so that everyone is on the same page, what we're doing right now is we're taking a bunch of forms, we're filling them out and we're getting them ready to send to someone. So we're stuffing them in an envelope and getting ready to send them off for signature. So these envelopes are a group of files that you've gotten ready to send to your client. So that's what the terminology is there. So we can call it whatever we want. I always suggest uh, putting in the name, the address name, maybe a quick descriptor. So we'll call this APS. And I like to put in the date and time as well, just to make sure that if, if there's a bunch of sign backs and everything, this is kind of cataloged properly. Here we go. We've got it now as a saved envelope. Remember before we had these three tabs, I told you I'd tell you later what envelopes meant. This is what envelopes are. So again, we can go to the forms. This is where we were before. File details, this is just the, the important information about the file, as well as the contacts that are gonna be involved in signing it. And then there's envelopes. So these are packages that we're getting ready to prep for signature. So if you wanna go back into this, you can just click on the three sandwich, so there's the three but dots there, click on edit. You can rename it if you decide you didn't name it properly. You can delete it if you create it and you say, hey, I just wanna start over again. Okay. So now that we've got this prepped and ready to go, we're ready to send everything off for signature. So that's what I'm gonna show you now is how to take the forms that you've created in this envelope and get them ready for signature in DigiSign. Now we've filled out all our forms, we wanna send them for signature. That's where SkySlope Forms transitions to DigiSign. The second that you click on this prepare signature button is when we move from one to the other. So I'm gonna click on that right now to show you how to send these into DigiSign. The first thing it's gonna say is create an envelope. It's a good chance you've already done this. You may have already named your envelope, but if not, you can rename it up here accordingly. I like to put in the address, maybe the descriptor, and maybe the date, just for my personal bookkeeping purposes. The next thing you wanna do is take a look over all of the people that you want to be involved in the signing process. We've got two buyers, Penelope at the bottom, Tom Cruise on the top. We wanna make sure they're both signing, the APS, working with the realtor, et cetera, et cetera. We've got the name of the agent. In this case, it's Pam Prescott. I'm in her account, so she needs to sign as well since we've got a buyer rep agreement in here. Then there's the seller and the seller agent. We want uh, no actions on their part as well. It may say like choose one then you just choose no action because we're not involving them in this signing process at this time. We'll let them decide how they wanna handle the signing. Okay, so I click on next and it will take me into DigiSign. So here we are in DigiSign. We've got all of our forms all here. We've got the same area as before. We can scroll up and down. You can scroll through all the forms and make sure everything's filled out properly. You'll notice it's already started to pre-populate the initial blocks as well as the signature blocks, and it does that smartly. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanna take a look on the left here so everyone kind of has an idea of what we're looking at. Along here, it shows you all the documents that we had previously filled out. You can use these for navigation, quick navigation, like I mentioned before, uh, just by clicking on them, or you can scroll up and down to continuously go between the different documents. You notice that it changes on the left as I get from one to the next, it shows which document you're on. Here's the recipients. Before we went into here, right, when we click the prepare for signature button, this is where, that's where we create this, the recipients. But if we need to change anyone on the fly, we can edit the recipients by clicking on the little three dots there, clicking edit recipients. You can add new recipients. You can edit existing ones. You can delete ones, right? You can change people's email addresses. Maybe I'll change Pam's to my email address here just to make sure everything comes to me, right? 
you can also choose signing orders. So if you wanted, say the agent wanted to sign first before sending it to the clients, you could add a signer group. They see it says who signs first, who signs second. You can click and drag Penelope and Tom into the second signer group. And then if you went ahead with this, in this configuration, Pam would have to sign first, Tom and Penelope Cruz would get the notification to sign after Pam's signatures are complete. We don't wanna do that though, so I'm gonna put everyone back up to the top. And if someone just, if you just want some, one of these people receiving a copy, like maybe it's the agent that just wants to receive a copy so it doesn't require the signatures, you can just drag them into the bottom here. They just receive a copy at the end. Okay. So I'll click on save. And here's another important thing too. Once you send your signatures out with all the forms, it gets sent via email. So you want to make sure the email that you're sending automatically from DigiSign makes sense. So what I definitely would do would first off edit the subject line, change it from you have documents to sign because in DigiSign, some of these envelopes are going to be organized by the name of the subject line. So you may want to change this just for your sanity sake. So you don't have a million envelopes called you have documents to sign. So whatever the address was, I believe it was 195 Winford. Let's call it APS. Uh, and then I'll just put in the date. Again, you can use whatever kind of method you have for these things. We'll put that there. As long as like your client knows it's coming and they understand from the subject line what it is, you can change the message as well if you'd like. And you click save. So make sure you do that first if you can. So now let's start prepping this for signature. As I mentioned before, a lot of the signature blocks will already be filled out, but not all of them. And it's always good to go through and make sure that all the, the, the lines are filled out properly. And we're going to do a few of those here. Um, first off, you can do one person at a time, or you can kind of change signatures on the fly. I'll show you how to do both. But let's say we wanted to just uh, start with Tom Cruise. We want to put in a few things here. We need an acknowledgement. We need to put his name in there. So you click on full name. There we go. Put it right in that spot. Then let's say we wanted Penelope Cruz's name too. There's two ways we could do that. We can add another full name here. And then there's this little hovering toolbar that pops up and you can change people's, like who's involved in that signature block or in the name or whatever, just by selecting them there. Or you can also go up to the top here and just switch it over. So anything that you start to add will be by default as Penelope. So if I wanted to add it again, like I could add as many times as I wanted to, and it would come up with Penelope instead of Tom. Okay, so put their names there. I want to add an initial because it's missing the initials here. Uh, let's put in the initials for Penelope and Tom into the section. You just click on the initials tool in the top. Then you just can click on it again to add a second one. Drag it over the right spot. You can resize by hitting the corners here. This one I want to change to Tom. So there we go. I've added full names, initials. Let's say, whoops, I deleted Tom's signature and date field by accident. Easy enough. I can just add those back in by clicking on signature along the top. Let's change it to Tom up here so it'll default to Tom. Click there. You notice everything's color coded, which is amazing too for visual purposes. Resize that a little bit. Then I can also add a date. Click on date along the top pop it in here and there you go it adds the date attached to whenever tom ends up signing it there's a few other things here too i won't get into all of them you can do a time which is like a date and a time uh hooked up next to each other as you can see it does both the the time attached to the date but we don't need that here so i'll just delete that you can also add check boxes that's a bit more of a niche use case so i won't go into that here uh, but the other important thing is that you want to know how to add text fields because this comes up a lot, especially if you're uploading your own documents, because they're not fillable in SkySlope forms. You have to do it after the fact by adding text fields when you're in DigiSign. Okay, for instance, like here, I, oh, whoops, I forgot to put in the name of the brokerage, just as an example, right? So one thing I can do is I can click on text field and I can create a text field here. Just resize it so it takes up the whole thing. And I can actually put that as Century 21 Heritage Group Limited. Okay. Now, one important thing is you don't just add a text field because right now you notice this is linked to Tom Cruise. It's, it's colored orange and there's a little floating TC next to it. So if I just left it like this and sent it along, when it gets to Tom, he can actually change that text. 
You can make it read only by clicking on the read only so that you can't change. And that's what you want to do. So as soon as it turns gray, you know it's no longer attached to a signatory. This is now locked in as, for all intents and purposes, part of the form. It can't be changed. Right? The final thing is the strike through tool. And this is pretty self-explanatory, so I'll just show it quickly. Maybe I'll scroll down and pretend like we're scratching out a, a clause in the Schedule A. Let's say they didn't need to worry about the financing clause, or uh, we'll just click on strike through. You can just draw it however you want you and change the color. You can resize as you need to, just like that. Right? Nice and simple. And then you can maybe add the initials next to it that you need to for Tom Penelope to make sure that they're acknowledging that being scratched off. Okay, so that is DigiSign to get everything ready for signature. The next thing you would do is send it. But before we do, I'm going to show you what happens when you click on save and exit. In case you don't have the time to finish doing this yet, you click save and exit. And here we are. It's brought us back into our envelopes section. Again, here's 195 Winford, our file. Here are all the forms we had before, and here's the envelope we've created. Except now when we click back into it, it goes right back into DigiSign. Okay, so here we are here. And once you're ready to send it, you can click the send button. It'll just say double check that your email subject line is the way you want to do. We've already added that from before. Uh, you can put an email message like I mentioned before and click send for signatures. And then people will receive emails um, asking them for signature. So I'm going to click on I'm done. Now you'll notice right away this has changed. The status is now says sent one minute ago. You got a nice little progress bar. You can keep track of who signed it. And you've got different options here as well. You, if you say, oh, oh man, I made a mistake. I need to go back and correct things. I forgot a signature or initial block. You can correct the envelope, which will bring you back into it. It'll cancel all of the signatories. Uh, so if, any, if you've, the emails have already gone out, if anyone tries to come in and sign it, it'll say, sorry, this is no longer available. You can resend it if you need, if someone for whatever reason didn't get it the first time, needs a quick reminder to sign it. You can download the envelope. So this is downloading a long PDF of all of the documents together. You can separate it out into individual PDFs. That's for each form. So you get your APS and you're working with the realtor as an example separately into separate PDFs. Once everyone's done signing, you can download the digital certificate. You can also view the history. I'll just jump into that for a second. You can see, okay, it'll say, like, you know, after someone signed, it'll say Tom is signed, Pam is signed. It'll give you the date and times. And you can even download safe certificates from here as well if you need to download those digital certificates. And then finally, you can either print or you can uh, the, the, the envelope or you can cancel the envelope altogether. Okay, so I'm going to jump in to the email just so you can see what this side of it looks like. This is the email that DigiSign will send to you and your clients, whoever is required to sign this remotely. It's a pretty simple email. You just click on get started. You'll notice that this the subject line was what we put in before and the message is what we put in before as well. So click on get started. It'll jump that person right into a DigiSign signing. You have to accept the terms. And then you've all seen something similar to this before. You click on the start button along the top. You click on the first field. It'll ask you, okay, do you want it? You can draw your signature. You can choose a style, whatever they pick. Then you just click on all the fields as you go down and it shows you your progress down here. We've got 19 to do, so I'll click through these as fast as possible. I'm just doing Tom Cruise's signatures along here. Oh boy, a lot of signatures required here, but we'll get through it all. And then once it's done, you just click on, fin they click on finish signing and it'll say, oh, thanks for your autograph. You can download the current version of it and it'll also send that person a copy at the end of the completed documents. Okay, so jumping back into ours, you'll see that when we go back in, we, hey, it looks like Tom signed, signed by one of three, Penelope and Pam still need to sign it. But now if you look in the history, you can see, oh, okay, it was viewed by Tom at a certain time. That's when he opened it up, and this is when he signed it. You can also view and download the certificate. Shows you there's still two people left to sign, both Pam and Penelope. Okay, now I'll just jump into the future for a second. And with the magic of TV editing, everyone has signed it. I've jumped into the future, and now you'll see that you can actually go through and you can do things like view the history. Okay, everyone's signed. You can download the digital certificates. 
If I go back here, this is updated from 303 to completed. It just took a second there. I can download the certificate. I can download the whole envelope. I can view the history. You'll notice a few things disappeared here. Like I can no longer cancel the envelope or correct it because it's done and signed. But all the things you need to do to put it into your files are there. And there you go. Now you know how to create an offer and get it ready and done for signing through SkySlope Forms and DigiSign. There's one more thing I want to go over in SkySlope Forms because I think it's probably a fairly important thing to, get to, to explain to everybody. And that's collaboration. Because if you're going on vacation or if you're working on a file with an agent, maybe you're co-listing something with someone you don't normally co-list with, you want to make sure that they have access to your files in a pinch. Now, the front desk staff, management team, we all have access. We can, we can help you out with this. But if you want to give access to a certain agent, this is how you do it. You click on your name in the top right when you're in SkySlope Forms and you click on My Team. And once you've clicked on this, it'll show you a list of all the people you're collaborating with. This is a very long list for me because I've got an admin account here. This will probably not have nearly as many people that you see. However, if you want to add an agent to it, all you have to do is click add people on the right here. And what this will do is you can send an email to someone and it'll give them permission to access your files. So if I click send, like that, it'll send an email to me to say, okay, you've been invited to share with Pam Prescott. Then it'll also pop you in that person in here, especially if they already have an account in our brokerage saying that they're sharing your files. Again, this is really important. If you're gonna go away on vacation for a week and you need people to access your files, make sure you do this before so that they can access your files. And if you wanna revoke that um, ability later, you can go back into Teams and click on stop sharing. The final thing I also wanted to show too is SkySlope has an app. It's They've got an Android and an Apple app. However, currently, and by the time you're watching this, the Android app may be available already, but they have just recently updated their iOS app, so for iPhones, to be a fully featured app where you can access SkySlope Forms, SkySlope DigiSign, in a very feature complete way. You can do absolutely everything that you can do on the web, on your phone. It's apparently a very good app. I would definitely suggest downloading if you have an iPhone. And if you have an Android device, good chance by the time you end up watching this video, it'll be released for that as well. I've been told that should be available by the summer of 2023. So keep an eye out for that in the Android app store as well. Currently, you can download the Android version of the app, but it isn't fully feature complete. It's very bare bones at the time. And all you can really do is look at your documents and deficiencies currently there. And one final thing I want to mention as well, because the admin are going to be using SkySlope over BrokerWolf now to do transaction management. And don't worry about the ins and outs of that. But the one thing that you're going to start noticing is, is your deficiency notices. So if you've been missing signatures or documentations for a specific transaction are going to look slightly different different. So you're going to start getting emails whenever you've got a deficiency notice from SkySlope that will come and they'll look very similar to this. So this just gives you an example of one that was sent to me saying, okay, there was an incomplete bill in the listing agreement. I forgot to fill out the uh, cooperating commission is blank apparently. Then also like on the unlost data form, there were some errors as well. My schedule A was fine. My working with a realtor was fine and I'm still missing two forms. So it will send you the notices with comments which is absolutely amazing and a breath of fresh air for both us as well as our admin. So keep an eye out for those. You'll notice those coming in and making this process a lot smoother. All right, and that's about everything we want to talk to in this introduction to SkySlope and DigiSign. If you have any questions, talk to your manager, talk to your front desk or admin. They're more than happy to help. Thank you so much for watching. If you like our video, please hit the like button, the subscribe, and even the little bell to get notifications just so you can stay in touch and watch more of these great videos.